Did you know that a whopping 50% of the UK's network rail budget is spent on track maintenance, with 10% of that being on track geometry bolts? Track geometry was also highlighted as a cause in 45% of derailments investigated by the UK's Rail Accident Investigation Branch. One of the most serious track geometry faults is a twist. So what is a twist? A twist fault is a condition where there is a difference in cross levels between the rails over a short distance of track. In the UK, twist is measured over 3 metres, or 5 sleepers. This is because of the shortest wheelbase that runs on the network. Let me know in the comments if this is different in other countries. It is common to report twist as a gradient, such as a 1 in 250 twist. There are two terms that are important when it comes to twist, static and dynamic. Static twist is measured with a cross level, and while the track has no train on it, so unloaded and with no movement. Dynamic twist occurs under the passage of trains, when a load is present. It is most likely to be from voiding under sleepers. Equipment known as void meters are placed under the rail to measure the movement or voiding of the sleepers. We will look later at how dynamic and static twist combine and how twist overall is calculated. Now you know what a twist fault is, let's look at why they pose a risk to trains. The twist fault, through a dip in the track, causes loading and unloading of one or more wheels on the train wagon. This can lead to loss of contact with the running surface, and in the worst situations, the wheel flange climbing the rail and derailing. This is called a flange climb derailment. A twist is different to a top fault in that the dip is on only one rail and is isolated to a single location. It also causes the wagon to twist around its central axis. Imagine hitting a pothole in your car where one corner of the car drops. This is similar to a twist fault. It's also similar in the way that it can worsen over time as the loading and unloading causes further deterioration. Certain types of train vehicle are more susceptible to twist faults than others. Key to this is the suspension and vehicle length. Vehicles with stiffer suspension and shorter wheelbases are at a greater risk. These vehicles are freight wagons, particularly older types and designs. Passenger vehicles are longer and have softer suspension to enhance passenger comfort, therefore less of a risk. Finding twist faults is an important part of maintenance inspection. Given the significant dynamic nature of most twists, finding them through visual inspection alone is very difficult, especially in access with no trains running. Because of this, trainborne inspection is the favoured way to go. Specially designed trains run on the network, recording data on a number of variables, such as gauge and the position of each rail. The different levels between the two rails can then be highlighted if they breach certain levels. Track recording trains are used to find all types of track geometry faults, from gauge spread, top and line faults, to twist and cyclic top. For more on track geometry, please check out our track geometry video, link in the description or at the top of the page. In some areas that are complex, further investigation might be required to isolate the issue causing the twist. This is where void meters could be installed through the site, left to allow them to record the track movement before the maintenance team returns to remove the issue. So how do we calculate the level of twist? The two things you need to know to calculate the level of twist through a site. CAN or cross level readings, this gives a static twist value, and any readings from void meters. This ensures you account for any dynamic twist through the site. The next thing to consider is if the issue is on one rail consistently or changes. A lot of things to worry about, right? So let's break this down into a few examples. Here is a length of track with 10 sleepers. Let's give the rails the names Cess and Six Foot so we can differentiate easily. First up, we will look at a static twist on a single rail, in this case, the Six Foot rail. We have the cross level values recorded at the site in a table. These are also shown next to the sleeper on the side that is higher. So in our example, the six foot leg is 30 mil higher than the cess leg at sleeper one. We can see that the issue is the dip centering around sleeper five. Now remember, we said that twist is measured over three meters or five sleepers. So to find the worst twist value, we need to calculate the difference. Let's put another table up with the difference or twist. Our first value is the difference between sleeper five and sleeper one. 30 minus 10 gives 20 millimetres of difference, or twist. The difference between sleepers 6 and 2 is 13, because 25 minus 12 gives 13. Let's populate the rest of the table. 
When errors are on the same rail, we need to subtract the numbers to find the difference. So we've done all the differences, and the worst twist value over the length is between sleepers 5 and 1. But how do you quantify this level of twist so that it's comparable to other faults? We take the difference and divide it by the length. So 20 divided by 3000, remember we're working in millimetres, which gives us 1 over 150. So this twist can be described as a 1 in 150 twist. This is the gradient of the twist. What happens when the high rail changes? If the cross level difference is on the opposite rail. Let's put some values in our diagram for our track length. We can see on sleepers 1 to 7, the 6 foot rail is still our high rail. However, on sleepers 8 to 10, the cess rail is higher. When noting this on the table, you can see that sleepers 8 to 10 have negative values. This shows the difference in the high rail. For our first few difference values, we still subtract to find the difference. But when we come to the difference between sleeper 8 and 4, we need to add them together to get the difference. This takes into account the fact that the train will rotate from one side to the other as it passes over the dip firstly on the 6 foot rail and then the dip on the cess rail. This gives us a difference of 20. We do the same for the last two and as before we work out that this is still a 1 in 50 value twist. There is a great way to remember whether you add or subtract when working out twist. It's oasis. Opposite add, same is subtract. So how do we include dynamic twist? Dynamic twist values will be in terms of the amount of voiding under a sleeper. We treat it using oasis, but we adjust the cross level readings before we work out the difference. Let's go back to our first example, but say that at sleeper one, the void meter, shown as a yellow disc, measures 15 millimeters of movement under the cess leg. The only other void meter through the site showing any movement is under sleeper 5 and shows 5 mm movement under the 6 foot leg. So on sleeper 1, given the void and the high rail are on opposite sides, we add. This gives us a value of 45 mm. Think of it as when the train goes over the area and the cess rail is pushed down another 15 mm as the void meter indicates. This giving us now a difference between the, of height between the two rails of 45 mm. On sleeper 5, we take the 5 mm away from the 10 mm, because when the train goes over, the voiding decreases the difference in height by 5 mm. Let's put these values into the table of difference and work out the twist across sleepers 1 and 5. So then we do the 45 take 5, which gives us a twist of 40 mm. This in turn gives us a twist value of 1 in 75 mm. So now you know how to calculate the gradient of a twist, but what does this mean? The smaller or sharper the gradient, the worse or more risky a twist is. So a 1 in 90 twist is worse than a 1 in 200. In the UK there are set limits that dictate how a twist needs to be responded to. The table shows the required responses. You also notice that curvature does become a factor with curves of less than 400 meter radius posing more of a risk, therefore needing to be repaired quicker. When twists become serious enough, one in 90 or worse, the risk to trains is high enough that the line needs to be blocked and repaired immediately. It's common to find twist faults in the same kind of areas or with the same underlying causes. A few of these areas that you're more likely to get them are wet beds, dips joints, broken or indented sleepers, the run-ins and run-outs of structures, way beams and level crossings, caused by the wear at crossing noses, or at breather or adjustment switching. There are many more, and it is an infinite list, however those are common areas you're likely to find them. So lastly, how are they removed? Twist faults can be repaired by removing the voiding and correcting the cross level. This can be done by measured shuffle packing, where chippings are used to fill the voids. However, to fully remove the issues, the underlying cause has to be addressed. This can necessitate more intrusive work such as sleeper changing, ballast renewal or tamping. Thank you very much for watching this video on twists from the P-Way engineer. I hope you found it useful and you know more than you did when you started watching this video. For more, please visit the channel, visit the website, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on all our new videos, and drop any questions in the comments below and give that like button a hit. Thank you.